Welcome everybody to the next installment of our journal club. We're going to be doing something a little bit different uh, this time. It's a clinical paper on a very short clinical research paper on a compound uh, that's uh, available called MitoQ. Um, and it's supposed to improve mitochondrial function by acting as a, basically as a really, really strong antioxidant that gets into mitochondria. Um, and the paper we're going to be reviewing is this one. And uh, the background is a little different from what you're used to because um, I have an obligation to do something here at my home, so I have to do this from home. And we've been having some technical difficulties based on my new setting, so we're a little late, so sorry about that. So I'm gonna share the screen here. Oh, and I'm Oliver Medvedic, uh, and Steve Hill is joining me, and we are going to be doing the paper that you should see now, which is the Rossman et al. paper, uh, Chronic Supplementation with a Mitochondrial Antioxidant, MitoQ is the name for it, improves vascular function in healthy older adults. So uh, before we kind of go into this paper, um, this compound was actually uh, synthesized, I believe, back in 2000. Um, and it's a derivative, really, of something people have heard of already, which is uh, coenzyme Q10. And I want to basically stop sharing this and go back to screen share, pull up these molecules, uh, MitoQ, OK. Share a screen. So you should be able to see this. This is basically something I gotten off of Google Images. This is coenzyme Q10 over here. Uh, you can just pull this up. Basically, it's um, uh, the other name for this is ubiquinone, and there's a couple of other a couple of variants of ubiquinone, uh, namely ubiquinol, and others that depends on their redox status, meaning the types, of, the amount of electrons uh, they can take up, and uh, hydrogen atoms. And uh, this one looks like to be the oxidized form. And uh, the 10 uh, refers to this aliphatic chain here, which is basically just a fatty chain of molecules. So 10 of these groups. Um, and this uh, ubiquinone, or coenzyme Q10, exists in mitochondria. And it's part of something called the electron transport chain. So this is going way back to your textbooks. So from days of biology long ago, although I have to teach this uh, still. Um, well, what I'm going to do is pull up MitoQ instead. And MitoQ is, uh, you'll see it quite a bit different. Let me let's see, move this to the Google page here. Um, so MitoQ is going to click on this. There we go. So you can see it looks a little similar. It's got the same group on this end. Um, it's got a, a chain of, you know, um, carbons and hydrogens, uh, not as long, um, but it has this phosphonium group here, this phosphate with these three um, carbon ring structures, right? And this, this sort of, this um, part that was added by chemists actually makes this molecule very permeable uh, through lipid bilayers and at the same time causes an accumulation in the matrix of mitochondria. So if you recall, mitochondria uh, are the little powerhouses of the cell that have two lipid bilayers, and between the two layers you have a gradient of hydrogen uh, ions or protons, um, and then uh, it's kind of a more basic interior. So this is gonna cause this to accumulate in the interior, and I believe these ring-like structures here are going to, these, are going to, these benzene rings are gonna cause this to go into, through the lipid bilayer. Uh, so this is a, a, this is a synthetic molecule, um, which I find to be interesting, uh, because you can buy this as a supplement, and it's not a naturally occurring compound to the best of my ability, uh, my knowledge. Um, it was synthesized. Um, you know, and it's it's done. There's been a lot of trials on on mice, um, and you know there has been a phase two, I believe, trial on Parkinson's disease that they didn't seem to get any um, good results. Uh, I haven't looked at that trial, uh, but it has passed. You know, safety phase one safety trials, um, and this trial that we're going to be looking at here is looking at um, adults. You know, middle age to you know later age, so people in their 60s and 70s who um, have, I guess, are 
pretty normal, pretty healthy, except that they may have, um, you know, symptoms of cardiovascular disease, some of which will be gone over in the paper. Um, and research up until this point, you know, implicated MitoQ and its powerful antioxidant abilities to essentially um, lower uh, this profile, basically improve this profile of cardiovascular functionality, uh, because evidently blood vessels are very sensitive to uh, uh, oxidative stress uh, resulting from mitochondria that are malfunctioning, and this uh, having this powerful antioxidant in mitochondria will alleviate this um, and improve the physiology. Um, so. One thing that the authors mentioned uh, in the earlier paper, uh, 2000, when they first uh, made the compound, is that uh, on the market you can buy coenzyme Q10, right, or, or derivatives of ubiquinone um, that are naturally occurring. But the problem with those is that you have to—they don't really, perm, you know, they don't go through the membrane, right? So they're synthesized in the cells, and they, unless there's some sort of, you know, um, passageway, you know, an active protein transporter, they're not going to get through. So you have to really, you know, eat tons and tons of them. So in order for them to be effective, they have to be concentrated. And this is basically where we're at now with this MitoQ uh, molecule. Uh, so let's go back to sharing the screen uh, and go back to the paper. So here we go. So this paper came out pretty recently. Um, let's see, what is the exact, it came out this year. And it came out in uh, February 28, 2018. So the revision was accepted. Well, end of February. Okay, so, you know, a few months old. So it's, uh, it's pretty new. And it's a very short trial. Uh, I mean, I guess they were, you know, I mean, medically that's referred to as a long-term trial, but this is a six-week long trial. Um, 20 healthy older adults, 60 to 79 years, with impaired endothelial function, uh, meaning that they have uh, one determinant of that is brachial artery flow-mediated dilation. So basically, your arteries have to stretch and expand. So I guess the uh, brachial artery is in your forearm, and um, you know, as as you get older, it, it is you know becomes less pliable and can't dilate as much. And evidently, there's improvement of this function when you take this uh, drug for six weeks, uh, along with other things that they look at, characteristics such as uh, plasma oxidized LDL or low density lipoproteins, which they say is a marker of oxidative stress. Um, so they used 20 healthy older adults. They initially started with like 54, I believe, and they winnowed it down to 20 because half of them dropped out because they couldn't make, meet the time obligations or, or whatever, or, you know. The trial was just too much of a hassle, and a couple more dropped out because they didn't meet specific criteria. So they, you know, it was down to 20 healthy adults, both males and females. And let's take a look at the data. So this is a pretty short paper. Um, so we're going to scroll down here, and you know, this is you know a lot of this. I believe. I mean, there's a lot of research in mice that goes back, you know, all the way back to 2001 where I believe was the initial paper that was published. Um, so here we have participant characteristics, but not a whole lot of clinical trials. So, you know, sex, men, women, you know, nine, nine men, 11 women, uh, age, average age, 68 plus or minus one. Uh, so all of this, all of this other stuff, glucose, uh, resting heart rate, BPM, systole, diastole, which is, you know, your blood pressure, it's all within normal ranges, you know, except for the uh, cardiovascular function that we um, mentioned earlier. So other than that, these people are normal. Oops. This there we go. So let me scroll down here. Um, you know, and they... The dosage that they give the folks here is, so they do two different dosages. They do 20, uh, I see 20 milligrams per, 20 milligrams per, uh, what is that, per deciliter, per D? I guess it is, I have to take a look at the, the actual concentrations that uh, medical doctors use. Um, and then they do an acute dosage also of 160, which is like a very short term dosage. Um, and it was pretty well tolerated, you know, they, they look at the, you know, um, 
most people who had nausea also had nausea with the placebo. So it's, you know, and just small numbers. Okay, so first thing that we have here is figure one, where they look at plasma levels of MitoQ. This is just basically looking after six weeks of placebo or MitoQ supplementation. Uh, I don't know why in placebo you would have MitoQ floating around in there, but... Um, but this is, they state that this is assessed 24 hours after the last dose. So in the paper, they stress that the, you know, that your blood levels might be much higher than this because this is 24 hours after they stopped dosing the individuals. So it's at these picomoles per milliliter, you know, this is, this is what's floating around in people's bloodstream. And here they actually, here's, you know, really kind of the important data, brachial artery flow mediated dilation. Right, so you want these numbers to go higher, so you want this dilation to be better. So they look at both absolute change um, and on the right and percentage change. So percentage on the left, absolute on the right. Uh, these are averages, placebo, mito Q, percent change. So we have you know a few percentage changes here that are significant, and millimeters change. And then here are these little dots correspond to individuals. Right, so placebo to mito Q. So if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like some individuals, so this is millimeters change, right? So zero would be no change and zero would be no change. So I guess, you know, this is the range for placebo. You have so, you know, you do have a fluctuation from zero to 6% change, but the average for the mito Q, if you look at individually is higher. And when you do statistical analysis on this very small group, um, you do get a significant change. So again, uh, the caution here, it's a small group of people, right? So we're talking about, uh, we're talking about 20 people here, right? Male and female, um, no ethnicities given, you know, uh, basically just the, uh, uh, the data that we saw here that they're fairly healthy except for their, you know, I guess their brachial artery flow and other characteristics. So I'm going to share the screen back again. Um, scroll down here. Uh, and this here is, I don't know why they have this here, but this is basically just an acute dosage, right? So they, um, they basically dose uh, 160 milligrams uh, of MitoQ, acute ingestion of 160 milligrams of MitoQ. Oh, I think the other one was actually 20 milligrams per day, it was not per deciliter, sorry. So 160 milligrams after six, after of MitoQ after six weeks of placebo or MitoQ supplementation. Uh, so if you are already supplemented in MitoQ, you don't get any kind of response, but with placebo, if you dose somebody with high level of MitoQ, then you get a small percentage increase in this brachial artery flow mediated dilation test. That's done. Um, they have another test that they do, which I'm not really familiar with the details. It's called the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, CFP WV, right? Which is basically, um, I guess it's a measure of elasticity also. It's, uh, I guess it's a, uh, I don't really know exactly how they measure the pulse wave, but it's, you know, it's the velocity between the carotid and femoral, which would be going from your neck down to your leg. And um, I guess if your blood vessel is more elastic, the velocity would probably be slower if it was a little bit stiffer. If, you know, you have a traveling wave, and I'm not sure if that's the traveling wave of, uh, of a, of, you know, the vessel, I guess, um, flexing. I'm not exactly certain how they measure that, but um, but the CFPWV values, uh, the velocity is supposed to go down, and it, and it does. Um, these are individuals, so placebo mito Q, meters per second, this velocity wave. Uh, so they have two different types of groups here. They have participants who are separated in two subgroups based on placebo, CPFWV values of greater than 7.6 and less than 7.6 meters per second. So if it's greater than 7.6 meters per second, uh, which is this placebo group here, then they're gonna be worse off, right? So these people have a 
kind of a, a worse uh, prognosis than people that are here, right? Because I guess the lower the velocity, the better. So these people are already healthier to begin with. So they see more of a percentage improvement. And I guess when they look at the numbers, um, I don't know the specific numbers here, but the percentage improvement is significant p-value of uh, less than 0.05. So basically the arteries are less stiff. And one other thing they measure is plasma levels of oxidized LDL, low density lipoprotein. So it's a circulating marker of oxidative stress. And again, uh, these levels go down. I'm not sure what the norm is, but you know, you see the average go down from 85 units per liter down to 75, right? So that's a significant difference. Uh, and they mentioned in the paper that no other inflammatory uh, markers that they've measured. So they looked at, I think, IL-6. Uh, this is in the paper, they don't have a figure. They looked at several different inflammatory markers and those did not change, right? So it's a very short paper. Um, there's no long-term trials. The one thing I'm concerned about, you know, for this compound, it's not, there's no long-term, you know, uh, years long trial to see what's, what's gonna happen if you take this. Um, it does appear to improve in a small cohort of people, um, you know, uh, elasticity of the artery. And they mentioned in the paper that um, the type of improvement they see, the type of improvement that's noted in the paper, which looks very slight, um, but is significant, this is the same type of improvement that you expect to see if you have a radical change in your lifestyle, meaning like after three months of exercise and proper diet, right? So six weeks of this MitoQ is in that respect equal to three, I'm sure the three months of exercise and healthy diet would probably give you other advantages, but um, at least the parameters that they're looking at here, those two tests that re, you know regard arterial elasticity, um, that improvement is is uh, is seen just by taking MitoQ. So take that as you will. So, um, so that's the paper. Um, Again, there is, you know, this, I think this is the only paper they mentioned in this uh, article that has looked at uh, cardiovascular function in humans um, with using MitoQ. Um, it does replicate the same type of uh, improvement in function that has been seen in mice um, and also, you know, um, isolated tissues, I believe, from humans as well. Um, but this is the first clinical trial of this nature done in relatively healthy people that just have, um, you know, uh, a slight, I guess, problem in their cardiovascular um, situation that can be ameliorated using diet and exercise, but in this case, MitoQ. Um, so, any questions about this? Not that I can, uh, not that I can see. Uh, no, nothing in the chat. I think everybody's happy with that. <laughs> pretty, pretty straightforward, isn't it? I mean, you know. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's you know it's straightforward, but you know um, it'd be nice to see. It's it, it's to me. I find it interesting. I, I you know I'm not. I I don't have a really strong background in clinical trials and, and I'm just interested in you know in how supplements are sold and marketed. You know, I mean. This, you know, I mean, rapamycin is a naturally occurring compound, right? But you can't, you, you can't just get it as a supplement, um, although it has some, some toxicities. Um, this is a synthetic compound that's, best of my knowledge, is not found anywhere in nature, um, yet it's being sold as a pill, um, which, I don't know, I guess you can do. Um, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's um, it's a crazy world, uh, supplements and, and, and their regulation, or should I say, not regulation. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you like other, other antioxidants like plant polyphenols, right? Mm -hmm. They're all resveratrol, all these things, quercetin. These are all, de these are all derived from plants. 
Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that natural is better than synthetic. We, you know, I mean, a compound is a compound. You take everything on, you know, on its face value, but, um, but I'd be interested to find out if there are any other supplements out there that are, you know, just completely lack of a better term, man-made, um, that are not found in nature that are just, you know, being sold as a supplement. Hmm. And I don't know if supplement would be the proper term, right? Because you're, you're, it doesn't exist in your body. So what are you supplementing? That's a good point. I never actually thought of that, but <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, obviously it isn't, it isn't a supplement if it isn't. It's like, I mean, it's aspirin, in, that, in that case, aspirin would be a supplement too, right? Advil as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, aspirin is, is, is quite often taken as, um, you know, the, the lower dose stuff or what sure, some sure, people call, sure. you know, the baby aspirin or its original uh, precursor, which is willow bark mm -hmm. um, extract. They, um, they're they frequently used in supplement stacks or, or whatever you want to call them, but they're not supplements. Yeah. You, you don't naturally secrete willow bark as, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, like right. That. Yeah. The same thing with plant, you know, plant polyphenols, but, um, hmm. But I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of been lumped in there with um, with the word supplements, um, natural medicines, or traditional medicines. You could put it under there. Uh, I mean, but, cer but certainly not 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 MitoQ. Unnatural medicine? No, there is no such thing as unnatural. The, 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 we 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 prove that on the blog that there's no such thing as unnatural. Um, synthetic supplement. Yeah, but that that to me implies that you're you're you know but you are creating a naturally occurring compound mm -hmm. using organic chemistry instead of you know s squeezing it out of a fungus. Mm -hmm. But you are supplementing your diet with it, aren't you? Yes, I mean you could supplement your diet with lead paint as well. But you could, yeah. I w I don't think it's going to be as good as uh, might acute. No, no, no. I'm not saying that it's as dangerous as I'm not, I don't want to make, give people that impression. It seems uh, to be having all sorts of good activity to date, you know? Um, but I would be, I'm, I'm just curious to see how these, how, um, yeah, I don't really know how this, how the whole industry works when it comes to, I thought I kind of did, but then, then I read about my Q and I'm like, Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, we've got um, a comment here from Nathan who says, doesn't 100% coca have the same effects claimed in this study? Um, Perhaps. I haven't read that trial. But like I said, lots of things will have the same effects uh, if you do, you know, diet and exercise. And yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so. Um, I mean, know. for me, the results here are interesting, but there are, there were a few, you know, pretty obvious uh, concerns here that, that the fact that it was only an n equals 20 yeah um that's a very small cohort now i mean obviously i know more about mouse uh, studies than i do about humans but w when we look at mice um 20 is not very good for what we call statistical noise um you need to sort of get up above 40 to 50 really to have a reasonable you know reasonably stable figures um otherwise you you risk getting statistical noise i'm sure it's probably much the same for humans because it's maths right yeah so you know you, it, it's a pity that so many people because you mentioned what was it 50 50 or so yeah who were in, in it originally they enrolled but they dropped out i mean how i mean you know it's it's really disappointing yeah, well, I mean, you know, I guess it's kind of reasonable once they realize that, uh, I don't know when, wh at what point they dropped out. They, you mm -hmm. know, they may have initially signed up and then they realized that they, you know, had to visit the proctologist five times a day and they realized, well, I don't know, it's still too much for me. I don't know about proctologist. I think you might be talking out of your room. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, it's just a pity, uh, and I think the moral of the story is you go for overkill with these enrollments. If if you think, you know, it, if if a lot of people are going to drop out, I'd have been inclined to probably enrol two hundred and hopefully ended up with a minimum of fifty. 
Yeah, and the interesting thing is that when you go back to the paper, and I'm just sharing the screen here, you know, if you look at individuals, you know, there's there's lots of, you know, and I'm going to go through, go to the earlier, this figure here. Uh, it's nice that they broke everything down into at least individuals so you can see how individuals work. Um, but I don't know, like, each of them. Let's just stuck over. Slowly. Scroll down. Because that's another thing as well uh, with with mice, they're much more well similar to each other genetically. Um, they're very similar, and their conditions. We can we can in a in, in a in a lab a mouse lab, we can pretty much guarantee the sort of conditions that they're all, um, you know, living in. So you know we know that they've all got access to exercise. Yeah. They all they all eat the same diet. But with people, that's far more difficult. So you've got a lot of confounding factors. Some people might be more active than others. Some people uh, might have a better diet than others. You know, yeah. it, it's always it's always on 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 my mind with these things, which again really highlights the need for larger cohorts again, so that you can then smooth out those anomalies. Yeah, and if we look at you know, and certainly with bigger numbers, we could we and you know, and uh, you know, you still have to commend the authors for you know, plowing through with this yeah. trial and 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 trying to get as much data out of this as possible. Um, but um, you know, if you look at these individual data points here, um, and I guess this line means that that's the same individual. So they do they do you know a double blind placebo controlled trial, but they do something called a crossover, which the same people later switch from placebo to, um, so they, they test this on, on the same individual kind of back and forth. Um, but some people have a much more, you know, stronger response. Some people, it looks like it affects kind of drop a little with MitoQ or actually it might be within the, you know, that just might mean it's, you know, within the statistical range of no, no change, but other people seem to have a very radically different, you know, um, at least, you know, from six percent, you know, from a six percent change to a almost 12, 11 percent. So, you know, a twofold increase. Right. Mm. So, you know, versus the average, which I think the average was something like 42 percent when they averaged all of these. So so what's so different about those individuals who have a, you know, a much greater response when they supposedly have similar other similar characteristics and um you know, I mean, it might be that this compound is, is uh, in general good, but it might be even better for a certain subset of individuals that you have to tease out. You know, if you have a larger, uh, larger group of people that, you know, you really just can't do with 20 people. Um, mm -hmm. And the other question I would have is, um, I'm looking at these subgroups, they have male and female, but, you know, I mean, males are, you know, we have greater stress on their cardiovascular system because of hormones and, and other effects. Is this, you know, is, are these individuals that are having a more pronounced response, are they males? I'm, I'm, I don't know. I can't really tell from this. Um, or, you know, what does it matter between male and female? Um, if you take it at a case by case basis individually, um, it'd be interesting to parse this out, you know, even further, but you'd have to, you'd have to have a larger group of people and, it's interesting that this compound is, you know, available, although you've been saying, Steve, that it's hard to get now. It's a backlog of order. You know, they're trying to synthesize it to keep up with demand. Yeah, I mean, I had a quick look um, earlier this week uh, at the usual places I go to get um, uh, some of the supplements that I buy, and uh, you just can't get it. It's all out of stock. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Q10 and, and, and the other related supplements. Yeah but the bioavailability on those is, is absolutely no good. It's, it's, yeah. it's just not absorbed into the, into the cell, as you say. Yeah. Um, so it's, you might as well not even just keep your money. If, if, if you can't get actual mitre Q, um, or is it, is it under patent? I would think it, it's patented. I would think. Well, if it was, if it was built, if it was designed in 20 years ago, well, it's almost 20 years ago now, right? 2018, mm -hmm. 2000. So they may have patented it. Oh, sorry, patented it. We have two different pronunciations, right? Well, yeah, uh, we mean the same thing there. Um, tomato, tomato. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, it's it might be off patent for all I know. Mm -hmm. I, it's or close to it. I mean, it's it the first paper where the molecule was first mentioned was twenty years ago, uh, eighteen years ago. Sorry, close to eighteen mm -hmm. years ago. So. Um, you know, but of course you can patent different formulations. Um, but uh, since this is available on the market, you know, um, there's no reason why, you know, participant-led, so-called participant-led trials can't be started and people, you know, we have some sort of uh, large group of people that self-administer and, and upload data. I mean, I think a compound like this would be prime uh, for that kind of trial just because it's, it's available over the counter as a supplement. Um, how I'm not sure, but it is. Um, and lots of people are already taking it. I mean, the people are taking this stuff and, you know, and based on a clinical trial of 20 for six weeks. So, um, so, so it'd be interesting to, to, you know, I mean, if you've got already tens of thousands, I don't even know how many people are taking it, but it must be a hell of a lot. If it's a lot sold yeah. Out. So, those people can be tapped into a trial, right? I mean, you've got this huge group of people that are that are taking it now. And probably some people are not taking it regularly, but still, I think you know, with the internet and social media, you should be able to pull together a trial that's got a lot of people and look at a whole lot of other data points. Yeah, that I mean, you know, that, that's that, that's sort of straying into the territory of citizen science, and I yeah. think, yeah, you know. I'm I'm all for that because these sorts of things could be done, um, you know, and it's getting easier now to collect that data. There are, you know, like a lot of these medical wearables are now becoming more sophisticated, and you know, you can you can relay information about your health, like your blood pressure and and things like that in real time. So it's it's making the possibility of these citizen initiated trials a lot easier, you know, and I think, you know, that would be really interesting to see something set up. Um, you know, if only, if only we had the time at least to sort of, sort of uh, do some of these things, because I was speaking to uh, Laura, uh, Laura, who's one of our volunteers, you know, um, she's a pathologist, and she was making a point a few, uh, a few months ago that there are so many supplements out there that just haven't had these really sort of basic uh, trials done you know and and, and it, it would be really useful to sort of get them done you know you've got lots of anecdotal evidence you've got lots of animal data and you know i think we should really set out to try and have a look you know look at the the, the top five or top ten most promising you know general supplements and run them through the run them through the mangle and see if they stand sure. up i mean you know people are taking it anyway i yeah. mean there, I mean, you might as well collect the data while it's being taken and see, see if it's, you know, if it's causing more good than harm or nothing or, you know, what's going on really. Or if it's only, you know, only effective for, for a specific group of people that, you know, that need to be more, that need to be targeted. And, you know, maybe I don't need to take it, but somebody else needs to take it right i mean it doesn't need to be all or none i mean it, it's important to know to to be able to diagnose who should be taking it right i mean um it seems in this paper even in this paper with this very tiny cohort of people you didn't have any significant changes if you know you were within a normal or healthier range for this brachial artery um test right so so are there other indications you know, that are, that, you know, that uh, somebody should be taking this or not taking this, you know, because um, it makes no sense to take it if it's not going to have any effect, right? And, and again, um, I don't know what the, what the real long-term data on this is, because I don't think we have any real long-term data on this. When I say long-term, I don't mean six weeks, I mean six, six weeks, years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> six weeks. But, you know, it, it is quite funny. Six weeks is considered to be long-term uh, data. Yeah. I mean, who came up with that? <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, um, I don't know. But, um, but anyway, that's how, that's what, how trials are run. Um, and, uh, we should, you know, we, we've been talking about this a long time that, you know, we, we should, we should, we should have, it, it, uh, there's a lot of things that could be done better in medicine, right? I mean, 
trials being run is 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 an easy low hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, maybe not so easy, but um, when tr when clin clinical trials were invented long time ago, this was way before the internet, right? Way before social media, way before connectivity, yeah. right? So, and that kind of still being run that way. Um, and, you know, now with all sorts of, all sorts of medical applications and, you know, ways to upload data in real time, um, you know, I mean, we should, we should tap into that yeah, much I mean, more than we are. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, as an example, a Apple has developed a whole range of, um, you know, software that you can actually obtain for free. And it, uh, I think it's part of the, uh, the kits that like, I think there's like research kit, creation kit. There's different, there's different kits that they do. And it's, it's all designed to facilitate data gathering for, you know, trials. It literally that, you know, things are out there. I mean, another thing that we were involved in was the age meter as well earlier, uh, uh, sorry, last year. And again, that's got connectivity. So yeah, I think you're right. I think we need to go more electronic and, and, and rather than, you know, old school. And, you know, you could have a huge cohort of people if you if you did it like that. You know, I'm not talking about 20 people. I'm talking about, you know, a few thousand people. Let, let's yeah. see if there's a trend. Let's get everybody on it for, you know, a couple of months. Yeah, and, and, pe yeah. and people are, pe you know, you give good directions to, to smart people. A lot of people are pretty smart, you know. They'll be able to. They'll be able to take. You know, I believe the proper measurements. I mean, we already have diabetics already do that, right? I mean, if you don't yeah. measure your glucose levels properly, you're you're dead. So you have to be accurate with your measurements. So you know, lots of people measure their own. You know, um, physiology every day, all the time. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it just depends what metrics you'd be looking to collect here. I mean. What, what what was it they used in the study? I mean, if if you're looking at sort of um, vascular health, I would look at really basic stuff as well to start as looking at inflammation, uh, things like C-reactive protein, things like that. If there's a drop in CRP, yeah. then you know there's something going on. Yeah, I think I think in the paper though they said there were they, it didn't affect C-reactive protein oh. and and they had no effect on blood pressure, so they had to use this this brachial um, artery flow measurement um but there ought to be other i mean they, they did measure lipid per peroxidation in the blood so that was a simple blood test i don't know how simple but you can certainly take a blood sample and mail it to a diagnostic center right and, and get yeah. that measurement um you know lots of people draw their own blood um or have somebody do it at a clinic um so yeah there's 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 all sorts of measurements that that can be made um, off site. Yeah, I mean, you know, not everyone's got an Alyssa um, <laughs> a kit and uh, and an Illumina yeah. assays uh, available at home, but yeah, there's no reason why it can't all be sent in from a simple blood draw, and and see what's going on. Well, I say simple. Hmm. Well, you know, relatively simple. Relatively simple, and they've got a new device that's come uh, coming out now. It's uh, that is able to actually draw blood, believe it or not, without um, without a needle. So it um, it's it, it sucks the blood through the uh, through your skin because your skin's not a, what it, it, it's slightly porous. So what it does is it actually takes advantage of that. I don't know exactly how it works, but it but it, it can draw blood. You just touch it to the skin and it will draw the blood out without a needle. Hmm. I think that's kind of cool. I can't remember who, who it was who was developing it. It might have been Apple or or Google. It was certainly some, some, some you know, big tech company. It wasn't sort of um, a small thing. But yeah. well, I remember getting vac vaccines done using this high pressure gun that they put up against your arm and that, that kind of hurts though. But it, there's no needle with that. It just goes right through. Um, Great. Get shot with a vaccine gun. Yeah, the tin, the tin four hat wearing brigade is going to love that one if they heard about that. Well, I mean that's how it's done in the military. <laughs> well, they got to they got to process lots of recruits, so everybody lines up and just whoosh, 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 whoosh. it's like an assembly line. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Oh dear. Getting all that <laughs> getting all that good old mercury eh, in your veins. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that always makes me laugh. That does that people don't seem to understand um, the difference between ethyl and methyl mercuries. But there we are. It's, uh, it's Some people just don't put the time in. So, Mita Q, the jury's out, or are we sort of edging towards? Well, I mean, worth looking at. Everything, everything so far about this compound seems to be positive. It's just, you know, um, uh, since it's already out there, I would say, why don't we, why don't we rig up a system that can actually collect, mm -hmm. harvest even more data, uh, and see how effective it can really be, and is it more effective for certain groups or subgroups of people? Um, are there certain indications that it's more effective? Um, certainly the averages look good, at least in this very small trial that's, you know, 20 people in six weeks. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it looks okay. Um, it seems to have a good safety profile. Um, it's past phase one trials um, for, I believe, for um, a Parkinson's model, which I don't think it, it was, you know, I may be wrong, but I don't think it was successful. Um, so you know, maybe for certain disease indications, it, it isn't, but, um, uh, but let's, my assessment is, you know, so far so good, it looks promising. Um, and, uh, but as always, more data is always required. Um, more research will I, be, will I be taking it? That's, that's, that's probably the more fundamental question. Would I be taking yeah. it? Should I take this? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I still have to work on my diet and go into the gym more regularly and see if I can get myself improved in that fashion um, before I start, you know, accumulating mito Q in my mitochondria. Um, yeah. I don't, you know, personally, um, I would, I would wait and see. Um, I wouldn't mind enrolling myself in a trial. I wouldn't mind being a guinea pig. Like if, if, if I would, if I would, you know, if, if I would, uh, you know, if I would uh, be helping humanity by contributing to data, data that would, you know, prove one way or the other, um, I would, I would, I would certainly enroll myself in a trial to take my OQ. I think so far the risks appear to be very, very minimal. Um, so I would, you know, I would do that, but would I be personally buying it and taking it, you know, with the hope that it's going to prevent me from having a heart attack? Um, me personally, I would say not yet, uh, but I, I certainly would take it, um, you know, for a trial purpose. I, I'm, com I'm comfortable with the safety profile, let's put it that way. I'm glad you said that because you can't get hold of it anyway. It's uh, sold out. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's certainly sold out in the UK anyway. I, I, I'm sure you could probably get it in the US. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I mean, there's me, yeah, there's a website, MitoQ, right? That makes MitoQ. Yeah, that's it. I've been there, and it uh, we just can't get it over here at the moment. I mean, yeah, the supply will resume sooner or later. For me, you know, I take a few supplements. I don't take lots. Um, I honestly, I don't think all, uh, most of them are any use anyway. I think it's dare I say snake oil, but there are some things that have got, you know, good health uh, evidence behind them. So I take them. I take the ones that I consider to be sensible, you know? Yeah. Um, would I take my IQ? I'm interested, uh, but I would like to see more data. And if I did, then obviously I, I would need to sort of quantify that by taking, uh, you know, biomarkers and, and measuring any, any changes that occur. And that's something that everybody really should be encouraged to do who, who takes vitamins uh, or stacks or biohacks or whatever you want to call it um obviously if you if you're just taking it on faith and hoping something will happen you know but hoping things get better that's not really that's not really the, the approach that you should be thinking of you should be taking biomarkers and measurements and doing things yeah. in a more scientific manner that way you know if you do genuinely feel that it's having a beneficial effect you've got the data there as well to back up that there are some positive changes too. So yeah, as with, as with all supplements, 
um, always try and record your, your biomarkers and take tests as you do it. Uh, and that way you've got a record of any positive or negative changes. And it's, you know, it's useful. Yeah, I think, I think me, you know, I lean towards, you know, I, you know, taking supplements that um, raise the levels of certain metabolites in your body back to earlier ages, right? If your yeah. NAD levels go up and you take something like NMN and they go back up again or go down and they go back up again to when you were in your 30s. Um, and I think that's that's positive. And 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 I think if if you take a number of different supplements that do that, that raise those biomarkers to youthful levels, you know, then you know because your body is being depleted because your cells are senescing and so forth, so on and so forth. You know, um, I would think that that would be an overall benefit. Yeah. Um, rather than taking supplements that are like mega doses of stuff, you know, like taking vitamin. thousand X, yeah, thousand X vitamin C, which, you know, I guess Linus Pauling was all for it, but. Uh, well, you know, uh, antioxidants is a classic, um, is a classic thing that a lot of um, uh, supplement people you traditionally have taken in mega doses, but we know more and more about redox signaling and the, the role of antioxidants and oxidants in that redox signaling and it, it's turning out to be a far more complicated picture than anybody anticipated. The whole idea that antioxidants uh, are good and oxidants are bad is, is, is just throw it out the window because it's not necessarily the case. The redox signaling system relies on um, the, uh, the oxygen species. So it, 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 you'd be in big trouble if you got rid of all the oxidants in your body, big trouble. So it's not necessarily a wise idea to sort of fiddle with that um, in my, in my view. But as you say, if you can upregulate repair systems and things like that, like autophagy that my acute potentially in, increases, I see that as a good approach. And, and the yeah. same with NAD repletion. I'm very excited about NMN yeah. and, and, and NAD repletion. In fact, we might have some uh, news to uh, share very shortly about that on lifespan. Uh, we've got we've got some interesting news coming up. Can't so say more than that, really. So, but so stay tuned. Um, I have to leave in a few minutes because I have a family thing to attend to. Um, but um, I I would say personally, I think you know one one thing that's missing from our healthcare system, at least here, is having data points from different stages of your life. Right. So if you're going to be taking a supplement later, and you want you expect to see your biomarkers improve. Well, what's your what are you comparing it to you can compare it to the average 30 year old right but you would probably be better to compare it to you yourself as you were right when you were when you were more youthful and see if you can get those levels to to get to that point right so um i would say anything that you do that would you know improve your biomarker profile to that of a youthful you i would think is the positive yeah, it's all about balance and calibration. I would assume. Yeah. Could be wrong. So, well, anyway, let's find out. So, okay. So there we go, Mike Q. The, the summary is more research needed, but we're pretty certain that taking it isn't really going to do you any harm. So, at least not for six weeks. At least not for six weeks. So, but as with all supplements, uh, you know, do be careful with them uh, and monitor your, your biomarkers, which you should be doing anyway. And, you know, just stay safe, people. But, uh, you know, go for it if you, if, you feel it's, if you feel it's worth a try. Yeah. But, uh, and, yeah. And, let us, and let us know how you feel after taking it. I'd be curious. Even though it's anecdotal, um, do chime in. <laughs> yeah, although I'd be rather suspicious if you were fairly sedentary and then you took it for three weeks and ran a half marathon. I'd be like, that's significant. You never know. Never know. Right. That's it. That concludes this uh, this month. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks very much for everyone uh, for joining us. And as always, thanks to our lifespan heroes who support us as monthly patrons and make uh, our uh, shows possible, and lots and lots of other things that we do. And uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, check out uh, www.lifespan.io/heroes. 
and of course do keep an eye on the leaf blog as we uh, we do all sorts on there as well and we will catch you next time thank you very much i was steve hill and he was uh, oliver medovic and um, still is and he still is and, uh, and if, we'll if you until we dissolve into the ether that's it and if you're really lucky next time we might stay the same people as well yes <laughs> all right take care Adios. then take care thanks bye